Good morning, and welcome to Ignite. Ignite it was founded as a way to bring geeks together to share ideas. And we do this in a fun way by just giving the speakers five minutes. Each speaker gets 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide. They have no control over the content. So as you're watching them go, they're keeping pace with their slides. And what it does is it forces the speaker to go through the exercise of making their content and their message very concise to the point. And you know, in a lot of the different cities, and it's spread to over 60 cities around the world, we had hundreds of people to come to these events. And people have launched books there. They've launched companies there. Uh, the creator of the Fail Whale logo ended up getting an, an art exhibit out of doing his Ignite talk. And when we, and each week we have a new Ignite show that comes out so that you can watch these online. And there's hundreds of Ignite talks available online. And as we were putting together this program, we asked a number of companies, how will you change the world? And so instead of each of these companies getting up and doing a demo, they're going to talk about how disruptive they are. How are they going to change the world if they succeed with their vision? So the five companies that we're going to hear from are MakerBot, which creates open source 3D printers, Cellscope, which creates mobile medical devices, the Institute for Creative Technologies, which is a DOD-funded technology lab out of Hollywood, Mental Images, which is, does a lot of 3D imaging, and Foursquare, which allows you to check in around the world. Now, the first talk is going to, become, is going to be coming from the co-creator of Ignite and co-founder of MakerBot. Please welcome out Bree Pettis. Thank you, Brady. <clears throat> this is really fun. OK, so I'm Bree, and I'm a co-founder of MakerBot. And um, we're in the future. You should join us. It's extremely fun, and it's really awesome. It's a 3D printer. You, got, you buy it, it comes as a kit, and you make it, and it makes things for you. Uh, I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Your children, instead of buying things, will end up designing things and, and printing them out on a machine on their desktop. Uh, you'll, we're going to cut out the whole trucking it thing and all, that kind of, all those kind of problems. They're gonna, we're going to have innovation in the, back in the, in, in the personal space. Started with the Industrial Revolution, this is kind of, let's look back a little bit. This is a uh, Jacquard loom, which basically, as soon as he built this, it was burnt down. And um, it shifted the face of the earth. We have all sorts of wonderful things now because of the Industrial Revolution. This Industrial Revolution II basically takes that to a really wonderful place where you make things on your desktop, and you're, we call it growing, because where there wasn't something, it builds it up layer by layer, and it makes it. In the, in the Matrix, when he says guns, lots of guns, we can switch that out and say things, lots of things. Because you can have just things that you imagine right there quicker than you can go to this store. And <clears throat> trench coat's optional. Um, these machines have normally up till now been in elite institutions. Like, and, and it's been kind of like the old mainframe days where you had to go to a college and sneak in and use it on the weekends. But this is kind of like the Apple One where you <clears throat> put together a kit at home and you have it on your desktop. Uh, this guy named Zago is in Germany. He uploaded a design he made of a really ordinary whistle. And within half an hour, the whistles, there were tens of hundreds of whistles around the world tooting. You can't get a whistle from somewhere to another that fast. Uh, it's really practical stuff, too. We've got, the, like, this is a guy named uh, Starno, and this is, somebody copied him. He uploaded his design to make squeezing the toothpaste easier. Marriage is saved everywhere. Um, it's open source. We're obsessively open source. We're trying to out, out, out open source everybody because it works. If you're not open source, you're probably going to fail. I'm just going to tell you that. That's just the way it is. That's what's happening now. We have so many wonderful things because we're open source. I could talk for an hour just on that. This is Thingiverse. We, we needed a site where we could share images and uh, share design files, excuse me. So we made Thingiverse. It's kind of like YouTube, except instead of uploading videos, you upload design files. It's so freaking fun to watch what people are making. This is Walt Disney's head. It, it, it mistakenly, his head got shifted, and his brain fell out. And somebody was so inspired by this picture, they, in fact, got a medical image of a brain and then took, modified the design and put, his, put a brain in Disney's head. It's wonderful, absurd things as well as practical. This is, uh, we're just working on a plastic, getting the viscosity right. This is PLA, polylactic acid, 
which you can um, use in our machine to make things. This is a pear snipper attachment and a pear catcher, and it's made out of corn from Nebraska. You don't have to design objects in a really hard to use design environment. You can do it in SketchUp, or like I have friends who are programmers, and so they just program objects. And instead of having a two by four Lego, you can have a 12 by 17 Lego if you really want. Oh, so Finn Flood needed a ring, and he needed one now. And so he printed one out, and then went off to Iceland the next day, and she said yes, which is so printable love, which makes me really happy. We're, um, we call it the Cupcake CNC because we wanted to be able to print things the size of cupcakes, but then we also decided to print frosting, which we can use as a support material. So nobody will ever have to hand decorate a cupcake again. Um, so this is a guy named Unfold. He's an artist, and he somehow managed to get a scan of his head and then uploaded to the internet, and he's now probably the most replicated human being ever in 3D. And we're working on a scanner, so it's kind of the washer-dryer combo, so you can just press a button and replicate things. Uh, these things build community. When you have one, you're a manufacturing center, and it's really fun, and people, you just, everybody smiles, and it makes these wonderful little beep-beep sounds. I'll have one upstairs in the lounge later so you can hear it. And these could be your kids designing things and making things. And it's just such a wonderful feeling to know, like, we, and we don't have to live in a consumer culture if we don't want to. And we can do it. Um, we have a lot of fun doing this. Right now, we basically pack boxes a lot because we're growing so fast. And uh, I really hope you get involved because there's so many opportunities. It's a really wonderful frontier where people come up to me and they're like, oh, we could do this. And I'm like, you could do that and be that rock star. So, um, I invite you to participate. It's really freaking fun to make things that you imagine right away. And if, I'll be upstairs later and come talk to me and hear the machine go beep beep. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. All right, good morning. My name is Dan Fletcher. And uh, the moment I leave this place, I think I'm going to go order one of those. That was incredible. Um, I'm a professor at uh, UC Berkeley, and I'm going to tell you today about our work on a project we call CellScope, which is a mobile microscopy device for disease diagnosis. Um, before uh, I talk about the device, I want to talk about the health conditions. Um, uh, our bodies are not really our own. We have a lot of collaborators in the form of bacteria and fungus, etc., most of which don't do us harm. Uh, but there are some that do tremendous harm. Um, uh, in developing countries, malaria, TB, and other diseases can cause significant um, uh, uh, disease impacts, including loss of wages and, and health, loss of life. Um, in malaria, for example, it affects 500 million um, each year, and it's only in specific regions where um, these diseases have most impact. This is a wonderful map that shows, scaled uh, by the number of incidences, where malaria is present. You can see Africa is huge, uh, North and South America are pretty small. And where are the doctors to help with the treatment of these diseases? Well, they're not in those places where the diseases are. So we have a fundamental disconnect. Um, where we are, uh, where we have health care, even with our health care problems, we don't have um, the disease. To give you an idea of what a challenge this is, um, imagine if there were only 80 doctors for all of San Francisco. That's the kind of conditions that are present in many parts of the developing world. So the question that we um, uh, faced and that we wanted to explore was, what do we do about this problem? Um, is there a way to link these two sides? the patients who have the disease with the clinicians who can help to diagnose and treat. And that's what we began to think about. And that's what was the genesis of the idea for CellScope. Um, uh, normally, in a, um, um, a laboratory clinical environment, the microscopy is the gold standard. If I can see a disease in your red blood cells or in your sputum sample, I know you've got that disease. Uh, but the microscopy is usually only in, in hospitals. Uh, but this is a very old technology. This is actually one of the first microscopes that was ever created, and it was created by a guy named Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. Tiny little device, and he discovered microorganisms. Um, technologies now have advanced quite a lot, but microscopy is still a gold standard for many conditions. 
And if it's not the gold standard, it's an important screening tool. Um, so more and more diseases, we know what they look like, uh, but where can you look at them? They're often not the facilities available in many countries. Um, but uh, even those that do have some microscopy capabilities have very limited and usually only in population centers, which leaves most of a developing country without the ability to do microscopy for diagnosis. So what can be done about that? Um, we would like to propose that cell phones can be used for microscopy. The imaging sensors are good enough uh, that if you clip on an attachment with the right kind of objectives, you can do microscopy on your phone remotely. The way that this works is you attach this, um, uh, this set of lenses, put the slide in, snap the picture, and then you can transmit that wirelessly to clinicians wherever they have to happen to be. They don't need to be right there in the room with you. And so this decoupling of data collection with data analysis is what we think can aid in these problems. We've already shown that we can look at malaria, we can look at sickle cell, we can look at tuberculosis. Um, all of those things that you would commonly do in a lab, you can now do uh, in the field. So with this device, um, we hope to actually uh, Im improve diagnosis by being able to do processing directly on the cell phone. The computational power of cell phones are increasing, the ability to do image recognition is improving, and that can make the cell phone itself um, a help in diagnosing diseases. And once you have an electronic image, that electronic image can become part of a patient's record. You can begin to track therapies and the impact that those therapies are having. So electronic record keeping is made simpler by already having that electronic image uh, transmitted. In addition to the image, you can locate where that image was taken. Geotagging is now quite common, and the ability to know where did this disease sample come from uh, is going to be an important uh, part of, we think, um, doing epidemiology in the future. Um, so we've been able to take these devices out into the fields. We've gotten good feedback from them. And now we're hoping to develop this technology into something that uh, we can uh, make available in many parts of the world. Um, so essentially, that's the, um, that's the vision. We want to be able to uh, couple the clinicians and the patients, even though they're remotely separated, um, and provide that diagnosis in regions where uh, they're not available now. Uh, but the availability of cheap imaging sensors and rapid communication technology is something that's going to help uh, all of us. This is something that's relevant um, uh, for all of us, whether we have an earache, whether we have a mole that we're not sure about. The ability to do imaging and to do transmission of data information is a particularly exciting time right now, and we want to be part of it. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jackie Morey from the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies. And I'm going to talk to you today about a project I'm working on that uses the virtual world to help soldiers reintegrate into civilian life. It's got a great big name for funding purposes, but we prefer to call it coming home. Now, we're doing this because so many of our veterans come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with serious problems, post-traumatic stress syndrome, major depression, or tra traumatic brain injury. And yet, only one in three of them ever go and get mental health help. And most of those don't even complete their treatment. Now, why is this? It's partly because there's a big stigma attached, partly because they're worried about what it will do for their career, and partly because they don't know they need help. Now, you know about virtual worlds. They're a lot like games, but more flexible. And you can be anonymous in them, so people will go get help when they might not otherwise. And one in eight Americans today are using virtual worlds in some fashion. Our questions were, can a virtual world become part of the veterans' reintegration process? Can we use it to provide social support, stress relief, and other therapies for veterans? And for us, we wanted to make intelligent agents to serve as guides and helpers in the virtual world. Now, we chose Second Life because it's a virtual world where we can control the content and we can write code to expand the capabilities. Uh, we've made a special gathering place for the veterans with resources for healing and transition. We're using complementary and alternative medical therapies in this space. We have a great lodge with two big wings where there are games. We have a central area where you can just chill around a fireplace or look at the waterfall, talk to friends, and just, uh, just relax. Now, we also have engaging and um, e exciting experiences in this area that the veterans can find, such as a labyrinth they can walk, or a story tower that we've made where you can walk up the tower and find uh, scenes from a classic historical warrior's life. 
Our virtual humans are serving as guides to help maximize each user's experience. And we have a greeter guide who can tell you about the space, teleport you places. Right now it's text only, but we plan to expand that to voice in the future. ICT makes virtual humans. It's one of our core strengths. We use them for all kinds of things, for negotiation, for marketing. Currently, we're working with the NSF to build two girl virtual human guides for the computer place at the Boston Museum of Science, and we call them Ada and Grace. We have a large portfolio of virtual humans. We use them for many things, as I said, and we can leverage this work to make these virtual agents for the veteran space in Second Life. Now, our simplest one is a labyrinth guide. So we have that labyrinth. She sits on the side. If you summon her, she will come and tell you how to walk the labyrinth in a very non-denominational, simple way. So you at least have something to go in with. The storytelling agent that we have is actually at the top of the tower. So once you've gone and seen all these uh, panels from the warrior's life and heard the story, you can then meet the warrior himself and actually talk to them, ask more questions, and get more in-depth information about that warrior's life. Our focus on therapies is for complementary and alternative medical therapies, and mindfulness-based stress reduction is our first attempt at this. We're working with the UC San Diego Center for Mindfulness. Those experts are going to actually take the form of an avatar and conduct group sessions in world. We have a lot of resources for the veterans. We have a place where they can find out about events, where they can find out about different therapies, and where they can also link to websites that are helpful for them out in the, on the web. Now. One of the things we've pioneered is the use of real-world inputs to affect things in the virtual world. So if you want your avatar to run the running path around the island, you only have to be able to breathe in a very relaxed, deep, regular way into a microphone, and that will cause your avatar to run. We've got support from Linden Lab for technical um, issues. We have Second Life Veterans Group in the world that's now 1,000 people strong that are serving as our testers. And we have medical, complementary and alternative medicine, and military experts advising us. So our future plans include putting in more camp therapies, alcoholics and narcotics anonymous groups, art and music therapy, a career center, and expanding the capabilities and, and the range of our virtual humans that are in the world. We're also going to run pilot studies next year with, a, with an army hospital. Now, the real world actually can be affected by being in the virtual world. There are positive effects that are being shown to happen. Uh, at Stanford, there's a group that has run a number of experiments, and we hope our work will also show the benefits of being in a virtual world for your real world existence. We have a lot of researchers working on both virtual humans and this virtual world. We have great funding from the Army and from the NSF, and we hope that we'll make a difference in the lives of veterans who have given so much for us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rolf Ferrican from Mental Images. Increasingly, the web is the world. Uh, we are uh, going to change the world by making it possible to use the web the way you use the world, in 3D. To represent the real world in the web, you need to be able to handle enormous complexity. Only a server-based platform can provide instantaneous random access to data of such complexity from millions of users simultaneously. Our technology reality server allows you to interact with 3D data regardless of their complexity from anywhere with any device capable of running a browser. To see what you interact with, it uses the world's most advanced rendering technology. Developed by mental images, it's being used by everyone with a need for the most sophisticated computer-generated images. To see what you interact with, uh, you, you have seen this software before. Uh, it's used by uh, people in the movie industry. For example, the first 70 minutes of the uh, movie Benjamin Button, where the leading character played by Brad Pitt is entirely simulated in the computer and rendered with our software. Or this scene from the Matrix movie trilogy is entirely computer generated, as is this scene from the movie Speed Racer. The cars in the movie were designed by a renowned car designer who also works for leading automotive companies. Uh, with Reality Server, we're adding interactivity and collaboration. Imagine a car designer uh, 
at his home in Santa Monica. Uh, he can access and interact uh, with the 3D data and modify them uh, in a joint session with a colleague uh, in Munich, Germany. The resulting design can then be reviewed by the chief designer on an iPhone. For a completely different use of reality server with the handheld device, imagine uh, ground crew at JFK airport servicing an aircraft engine as demonstrated on the display of the device by an engineer located in Toulouse, France. Or imagine the ability to visualize a new office design down to the light as it pours through the uh, blinds at any given time of the day or the artificial light at night and the shadows, the furniture cast that you're contemplating to purchase, possibly from a real server-based online virtual store. Reality server also allows to share 3D medical data. Here, a doctor and a patient are located in San Francisco while a specialist is at his home across the country. The doctor and the specialist can interactively review the 3D day MRI data of the patient and discuss possible treatment options. The data of the patient remain securely on the server. To collaborate with specialists, regardless of their location, increases the quality of medical decisions in a fraction of the time and saves lives. It also reduces cost. Finally, let's imagine a developer who is still in this economy going to build a major new building, but before he even starts, he can see every aspect of the finished building uh, from the exact location he's standing on at the construction site. He can also see what it's like to be inside the finished building looking out of the window at the city's skyline. So as you can see, anyone can use Reality Server with any device that's capable of running a browser. To build this 3D-enabled web, we need to assemble a massively parallel, scalable, distributed server network with vast amounts of storage capacity and computational processing power. The enormous processing power of the GPU allows Reality Server to service millions of users simultaneously and provide real-time imaging speed to each of them. So we are going to change the world by making 3D a ubiquitous experience on the web. I'm convinced that the most important uses of Reality Server are still to come, and including 3D search. And uh, I hope they will be developed by you. Thank you very much. Dennis Crowley. I am one of the uh, co-founders of a company called Foursquare, uh, based out of New York. Does anyone use Foursquare? Is anyone? Yeah, that's good. I can't really tell, but it looks like there's a bunch of hands up. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and um, about like where the history of the product and stuff came from. So this is. I like it when the things behind. So this is this, um, this, you know, I went on this trip to Sweden a couple years ago, and I totally crowdsourced the whole thing. Like, instead of going and, w and like, walking around with that Lonely Planet guide, I just went on Flickr, posted my itinerary, and had all my friends just kind of comment, these are the things you should do. And it wasn't like, you know, oh, go to this museum, do this and that. It was like, you know, go to this cafe and, uh, you know, check out the statues in the basement, check out the street art here, check out the street fair or whatever. Um, and it just turned out to be much better than, like, traditional city guides and stuff. So um, we were thinking about like, how do you like, take that experience of making like, cities more interesting and bringing it back to like, cities that we live in? Like, how do you make a city guide for the city that you live in? So we built this Foursquare stuff that's a lot about like, people and places. You check in at places, you know where your friends are, it kind of gives you recommendations of places to go. But more specifically, we're, like, we collect this content from users um, that's like you know, actionable items, like, oh, go here and do this. Like, go to this, not go to this museum, but go to this place and you know, specifically hang out in this corner. Go to this restaurant, specifically order this appetizer. Like, we, we pop this stuff up kind of all the time. 
Um, so as we're doing this, we kind of think of like, this is what life should look like. If this is a game, like you should think you should get experience points for doing things like to going to new places, for meeting new people, you know, just like you do in Legend of Zelda or any of these other games. It should be kind of like, that should be the, the way that life rewards you, right? And so we started building game mechanics into some of the stuff we're doing with Foursquare. So you go to different, you know, you go to different venues to get points, you go with different friends to get points, you bring a whole crowd, you get points for that. We have a leaderboard that's kind of like a, a high scoreboard for Saturday night. Like who's doing more interesting stuff? Like who's, who had the most interesting week? Who met the most folks? Um, and then we started like introducing these badge concepts too. So like you get like these little digital pieces of candy for interesting stuff. Like you get the school night one for checking in at like a, a three in the morning, like on a, on a Tuesday night. You can get the uh, far, far away badge for, you know, hanging out in the Upper East Side of, uh, of New York, is that right? So these are kind of like merit badges, but for grown-ups. It's like, how do you make these things that, um, you know, it's like you're, you're building these things that people have like this inherent need to want to collect and kind of experience. You're doing it based on like real world experiences too. Um, and what we're finding from a lot of our users is that like, it all seems like a game. Like, oh, you become the mayor of a place, you earn points to get these badges. But they're driving people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. And we're, ex we're seeing that we can kind of like engineer these experiences for people. Like set goals, I hate the cycle, it's all text. But you know, um, like set goals for people to try to hit, and then be like, oh yeah, they go out and hit them. Go see all the Oscar movies. Go to you know, all the sports stadiums. Go try to get 10 of your friends out at a given venue. Go to these different restaurants. And instead of just like making these recommendations, you build game mechanics into it, and people want to do it more often. Um, so has anyone used Nike Plus? I love this thing. This is like how, they, they are killing this. Like Nike Plus is one of these things. It tracks like, you know, how often you're, you're running. It's one of these things like, you know, when you start getting points for running, it will drag you out of bed on like a rainy Thursday morning because like, yeah, well, why would I run if I don't get the points? And if I do, I'll do it more often. Um, this, has anyone seen this video? This was, you know, going around the internets last week. Um, these guys are trying to like, how do you make a scenario where people take the stairs over the escalator? And so they turned kind of the stairs into this piano, and they said that like 66, 66 more, you know, percent of people started taking, you know, uh, using, using the stairs over that. Um, Oh, I'm going to be a slide behind. So we're doing this with like, you know, some of the badges. Like we have this gym rat badge, and people aspire to, as, aspire to kind of unlock these things. Um, you know, we're getting feedback from users saying like, oh, you made me go to the gym more. You made me go out more. You made me try these new places. And then, you know, the, the users are getting into it, but then the venues are too. So they're trying to use some of the game mechanics to encourage people to come to their venues. So they're giving away stuff to the people that have been there most often. They're, they're using the point system kind of to their favor to make this stuff happen. Um, we had this write-up in the Times, and there's this great quote about how, like, you know, we had, um, you know, we had these users kind of like jumping out of bed to go back to places and, rec and, and earn these points and reclaim their titles and, and kind of like, you know, work with these game mechanics. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that we've done right now, it's very much based off of, you know, it's like nightlife and social stuff, but like what, are, like, what are the different types of things that we can do? Like, can we encourage people to do more cultural stuff? Can we encourage people to travel more? Can we encourage people to do more like charitable stuff? Um, we're doing this, this, uh, this partnership with the BART folks here where, you know, we have these people that are checking in the subway stations. Like, sure, why not? Let's, let's reward people that are taking public transportation and we'll do it with these, um, you know, with our like batch mechanics. And then we've also started thinking like, well, what can we do in terms of um, like charitable stuff? Like maybe these points end up translating into dollars that, uh, you know, are then, uh, you know, donated back to local charities. So we have like this mechanic, we're generating all this stuff, and it's like trying to find a way that like, we can encourage people to do more interesting stuff, and then, you know, kind of like reward people for doing those experiences. But, uh, okay, I'm, oh, I have 15 seconds, I still go? Yeah, that's weird, but thank you anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> I, the thank you slide always wrecks it. Hi, I'm Matt Halpern from Omidyar Network. Uh, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you'd agree, all these presenters were fantastic. And I just sat, sat watching uh, the presentations, remembering you know, uh, and smiling about why I like living in Silicon Valley so much, and I think why we're all here. Um, so who is Omidyar Network, and why are we sponsoring Web 2.0? Uh, simply put, Omidyar Network exists to create opportunities for individuals to improve their lives. And last year, we actually put $100 million to work to try to meet that goal. And a lot of people think uh, we only make grants to nonprofit organizations, uh, which we do, but we also believe it's important to make uh, for-profit investments in ventures like the ones you just saw on stage. So where is that money going? Uh, it goes to two main areas. One is we call access to capital, and that's trying to bring financial services to the poor in the developing world. And the second, which is really why we're here today, is called Media, Markets, and Transparency. And here's where we're looking for companies and organizations that build, are building technology platforms to allow hundreds of thousands or millions of people to connect, uh, kind of like eBay. 
And the four areas that we're looking to do this in here are social media, online marketplaces, government transparency, and journalism. And to bring to life a little bit more the kinds of companies we like to invest in or organizations we like to make grants to, they include uh, companies like John's FM Publishing that he referenced before. Includes Dig, includes Meetup, uh, Wikipedia, and the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, the Sunlight Foundation and Government Transparency, and uh, uh, our most recent equity investment was a company called Quicker, which is right now India's leading online classified site. So one of the themes and one of the reasons we're all here uh, at, at Web2 or Web Squared this year is to how to make the internet a better place. And we're fortunate at Omidyar Network that we get to do this in everything we do every day of our lives. And with that, I'd like to extend an invitation to all of you to connect with me or any of my Omidyar Network colleagues that are here in the audience, or send us an email at web2 at omidyar.com. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. And thanks to all of you for your support this morning. I hope you enjoyed High Order Ignite. Hopefully, this will come back next year. Uh, we'll be doing a global Ignite March 1st through the 4th. If your city is interested and you want to throw one of these, go for it.